Welcome to my ESATS SAT Essentials video series. This is a 10-hour video personally paced SAT program that's designed to provide quality SAT preparation to all students. The series is split evenly between the three sections of the SAT, math, writing, and critical reading. The lectures cover effective SAT test taking strategies, review frequently tested topics, and provide practice problems that familiarize and prepare students for the real exam. The SAT Essentials video course is the foundation for all MyESAT courses and is used in conjunction with live MyESAT workshops. At MyESAT, our mission is to pave the way for brighter futures empowered by education for all students. Hey there guys, my name is Adam and I'm going to be your critical reading instructor for this video course. I am thrilled to have you joining us today. This is our first critical reading lecture so we are just going to set it off. The critical reading section of the SATs can be a complete jungle, but in this video lecture it is an awesome tool for you to get acquainted with the basics. In our time together I'm going to show you the lay of the land in the terms of critical reading SAT. I'll show you some of the effective, awesome, time-saving skills that you need to know and also some of the ugly pitfalls of the SAT to stay away from. I want to start out by saying that I remember exactly what it is like studying for the SATs. I remember because it really wasn't that long ago for me. You kids are almost full-fledged adults now, and you're mature enough and smart enough to plan through your own studies, so I'm just going to be completely honest with you from the start. So here is the true lowdown about the SATs. It's a hard test, but it is totally coachable and now with practice and prepare for it and your score will quickly improve I guarantee it but now I'm gonna tell you something that you may not want to know something that the SAT prep courses don't really tell you so it's kinda of hard to take so I'm just gonna tell it to you straight the truth is is that most kids don't improve as quickly or as much on the critical reading section of the SAT as other sections and that's just the truth just the truth as the sky is blue or the grass is green but why this is because the critical reading section tests the students on skills like reading comprehension and deductive reasoning and some vocabulary skills. And these are skills that are built over time by years of staying awake in English class, by reading hard stuff even outside of class, and from thinking a lot about what you are reading. Now what this boils down to is making serious, serious improvements on the critical reading of the SAT will just take more time. Well shoot, what does this mean for you? Did I just say that there's not much you can do for critical reading? No, not at all. And the critical reading sections of the tests is still just a test. And whenever there is a test, there are test strategies that are designed to target the specific ways that test is written. Are there special strategies specifically for the SAT critical reading test? Of course. And that is why you are here today. That's why I am here today. And that's why I have a job at all. But what about all that stuff I said about underlying, reading, reasoning, and vocabulary skills? Yes, those things are going to take a bit more time and work. So I'm going to be honest with you. If you are not planning on studying a lot for the SATs, I would say that after this video lecture, you should concentrate your time on math and writing sections. Those sections are going to give you more bang for your buck. I mean, you'll improve quicker there for your time spent. So if you don't plan on spending too much time, that's where your time should go. However, if you do want to do your best on all the sections of the exam, then major props to you. And that's what I'm rooting for. In this case, plan on upping your reading extracurricular and getting dirty with some practice problems. For more help on forming your personal SAT study plan, go to myesat.com for tips and resources. Well, let's jump into our virtual classroom. This is Maggie, my ESAT, your lovely critical reading TA for this video lecture. She's going to be my assistant popping in and out with useful information to guide us along. We're going to be going over quite a bit of material so the pace is pretty fast. If you need a moment to take a break or process the information, remember you can hit the pause button or even the rewind button. You're in control of the lecture here and you can adjust the timing that best suits you. Are you ready? Let's set it off. So what are we going to learn today? First we're going to meet the critical reading section.
I'm going to give you guys a brief overview regarding what to expect on the SAT. I'm going to assume that you don't know much about critical reading section yet. So I'm going to start from the beginning and work from the ground up. Then we're going to cover my ESAT recommended sentence completion strategy. Today's lecture is all about sentence completion. We're going to be focusing on sentence completion hard. And after today, I wouldn't be surprised if you went around completing everyone's sentences. So let's meet the critical reading section. I know it's a bit of a nasty beast. There are three sections totaling 67 questions in about 70 minutes. If you do the math, you realize that if you were to complete all questions, then you have about an average one minute per question. One minute is just enough time for you to sing the ABCs, or water a plant, or tell your friend a joke. Dude, it's a vigorously paced test. Now let's take a look at sentence completion. You should know the directions for sentence completion like the back of your hand. This is because the instructions are always the same on every SAT. Each sentence below has one or two blanks, each blank indicating that something has been omitted. Beneath the sentence are five words or sets of words labeled A through E. Choose the word or set of words that, when inserted in the sentence, best fits the meaning of the sentence as a whole. Got it? Good, because I want that to be the last time you read the directions. You're not going to waste your time on test day with this. Now I want you to think about the most important word here. Test makers help you out by underlining, so it's kind of a dead giveaway. Yes, the most important word is best. This means that sometimes there are two or more answer choices that seem kind of good and you'll have to decide which is best. Also, sometimes none of the answer choices will really tickle your fancy, but you still have to pinpoint why one is somehow the best. And because the goal here is to find the best word, that means it's important to read and analyze every answer choice before bubbling in your answer. Because even if you really feel a connection with one of these answer choices, you don't know that none of the others are better unless you read and consider all of them. Okay, the directions say that each sentence has one or two blanks. Approximately half of the questions have one blank and the other have two blanks. Sentence completion questions will test you on either sentence logic or vocabulary in context. Hard questions will often test you on both, so they will have hard words and be confusing. Sentence logic questions are ones that test your ability to deduce logical relationships. Often the sentences will be complex and long.
Vocabularies in context questions are one that can test your ability to understand sophisticated vocabulary. These sentences may contain vocabulary words that are hard and have tricky meanings. So now that you know what sentence completion questions are, so now what? Well now I'm going to talk to you about sentence completion strategy. And this strategy should be used every time. This is why the wheels in your head should start to turn. These four steps should be applied to all sentence completion questions. As you get better, the wheels in your head will start to turn faster and supernaturally and you will be a rock star at sentence completion strategy. But for now, since we're just starting out, I want you to take your time and really work through each step. Now get your pencil ready because I want you to take some notes in your notebook. I want you to write down each of these steps as we go through them right now. Step one, play detective. This step means to read the sentence carefully in search of the context clue. All sentence completion sentences will have clues in the sentence that will give you a logical idea of what the word in each blank should mean. Clues might be a description of the blank or imply a relationship between the blank and something else given in the sentence. Sometimes when there are two blanks, the clues give you the sense of a relationship between the words in the two blanks. Now you should circle or underline the context clue or clues that you find. This will help you with the next step. For example, in the following sentence completion problem, can you find the context clue? This novel portrays Mr. Jensen as a blank teacher, warmly praising his students one day and coldly criticizing them the next. In this example, you might underline warmly praising and coldly criticizing. Step 2. Fill in the missing pieces. After you've played detective and identified the context clues, try to quickly come up with the word that will fill in the blank. Try to come up with the word that will make sense in the blank in relation to the clues you found. Let's go back to our sample problem. We form an expectation of what we think the word should be before we even look at the answer choices. Pay attention to the context clues we found. They will indicate the meaning of the word in the blank. What word fits best in this blank? When you read this sentence, ask yourself, what kind of person gives warm praises one day and cold criticism the next? A weird psycho one for sure. But you can be a weird psycho for lots of reasons. Really here, try to think of a word that specifically describes someone who changes from praise to criticism all the time and not just a general word like weird or psycho. Try to be specific as possible. And no, the word is not mom. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sure your mom is wonderful. 
Well, let's say the word you expect is the word volatile. This makes sense because volatile means changing and inconsistent. Someone who seems way nice one day, and then way mean the next day, is definitely the poster boy for this word volatile. But what if you couldn't think of a good word? That's okay. Don't waste too much time. If you couldn't think of one word that will fill in the blank, but you do know the general concept of what would fill in the blank, just write the phrase or concept that describes what you think will fill in the blank. For example, instead of volatile, you might have written, changes his mind a lot. That's great too, as long as you are able to form an idea of the meaning of what the word should be in the blank. Furthermore, if you are still struggling to come up with a word or phrase, that's okay too. But if this is the case, then try to least quickly decide if the blank is a positive thing. Or a negative thing. This will help you eliminate answer choices and give you a good place to start guessing. Go ahead and jot in a positive or a negative sign over the blank. Let's see. A teacher that praises you one second and yells at you at the next does not sound like a good thing. Let's go ahead and make a negative sign over the blank in order to signify that the blank is a negative item. So why do this step? It might seem like a complete waste of time because why don't you just look at the answers first and then see which one fits, right? Well, this is why. Think about it. How many times have you circled a multiple choice answer because after you looked at it, you thought that it just sounded right? Maybe you didn't think of it until you saw it, but once you did see it, you said, hey, yeah, that'll work. And later, when you found out that not only was it wrong, but it totally distracted you from getting the right answer, which you totally would have got if you hadn't been distracted by that wrong answer. Well, this happens all the time, and test makers know it. It's called the power of suggestion. And test makers love sticking in false, fake decoys that might sound like they might be the right answer, but are actually not correct. This is a pitfall that you need to sidestep. And the best way to do this is to form an expectations of the words you're looking for before looking at the answer choices. Step three, identify the suspect. Up to this step, you should not have yet read the answer choices. But now that you have formed your expectation for the blank, read the answer choices individually and consider how they would affect the meaning of the sentence. So now you can see the answer choices. Often, many words can possibly make sense for the sentence. However, you are looking for the word that fits best in terms of being implied by the clues given in the rest of the sentence. In our example above, you may consider the following. Was Mr. Jansen an indifferent, uncaring, or mediocre teacher? Well, not necessarily. Maybe he was, but hey, maybe he wasn't. We don't know if he cared about his job, and because of that, indifferent is not a word that is implied by the rest of the sentence. We just don't know. Let's move on. Was Mr. Jensen an objective, fair, and impartial teacher? Again, you don't know. Maybe he was, but there are no clues that really indicate one way or the other. So again, not a great answer. Let's move on. Was Mr. Jensen an unpredictable teacher? Ooh, definitely. A man who praises one day and criticizes the next is clearly unpredictable. Because nobody can tell what he's going to do next. In fact, unpredictable means the same thing as our expectation word of volatile. So this already sounds like a really good candidate for the right answer. But we can't circle it yet. Not without looking at the other choices. I mean, you wouldn't just date the first cute boy you met in class, would you? No way. You'd at least take a look around to see if there are any cuter boys, right? We have to make sure that there are no better answer choices. So let's move on. Now, answer choice D. 
Was Mr. Jensen an ineffectual teacher? Ineffectual here just means the same thing as ineffective. Again, we have no clue. Well, not really anyway. You might think, whoa dude, I wouldn't learn well with a teacher like that. Probably he's not an effective teacher. But honestly, given the information you have, you just really don't know. Maybe Mr. Jensen is a wonderful teacher in other ways. Maybe he's really interesting and engaging. My point is, maybe he is an effective teacher. So this isn't the best answer either. Let's look at answer choice E. Was Mr. Jensen an unobtrusive teacher? Unintrusive here means unnoticeable or low profile. Like before, we don't know. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. So this isn't such a hot answer choice either. Looks like the best answer is C, unpredictable. You can see that there are many answers that technically could be true, and write this down in your notebook right now, that the right answer is the answer that is best described in the rest of the sentence. Mr. Jensen could be indifferent or objective, however, these cannot be the correct answer because they are not implied by the clues in the rest of the sentence. Also, write this down right now. You always want to check out all of the answer choices and pick the best one. Remember, we are looking for the best choices. So, not just the first cute boy or the kind of cute boy, but the cutest boy, okay? And if there are no cute boys, just funny looking ones, you just want to pick the best one. Or if you can't find one, well then you might just want to skip the question altogether. Step number four, replay the crime. So any detective knows that it's important to replay the crime in order to make sure all the pieces fit and make sense. After you identify your choice, your suspect, repeat the sentence in your head with the answer choice in the blank. Does the sentence make sense? Do the clues support your answer choice? If so, you've solved the crime. Let's replay our sampled sentence together. This novel portrays Mr. Jensen as an unpredictable teacher, warmly praising his students one day and coldly criticizing them the next. The sentence sounds correct. Unpredictable makes sense with our context clue. So what do you think? You think you got the first four steps down? If not, hey, you can always rewind and rewatch it. This is a video course after all. You can watch it at any speed you want. However, if you do get it, well, practice makes perfect. Now you knew this was coming. Now we're going to try out a set of practice problems. Coolio, I'm going to give you three minutes to work through these two questions. Now be sure to walk through each of these four steps. And in case your notes aren't that great or your handwriting is kind of sloppy, I'm going to put the four steps on the side of the screen just for you to reference. Good luck. You have three minutes and they start now.
Okay, time's up. Let's go over the answers now. Let's go over the questions together, starting with the first question. Remember, we are going to start with step one. Look for clues. Number one. Whether Jones is teaching advanced art classes or beginner ones, the teacher's animated disposition blank his passion for his field. What are some context clues that we see here? I would circle animated disposition and passion. The second step is to fill in the blank with our expectation word. So I would fill in the expectation word shows because a teacher's animated disposition or manner would show his passion. Now I'm ready to move on to step three. Identify the suspect. First, I want to read and analyze all the answer choices, eliminating the ones that are not in line with our anticipation. Remember, our anticipation is shows. I'm going to cross off A, misrepresents, and E, disguises, because these two words are opposite as shows. Then I'm going to also cross off C, satisfies, because satisfies doesn't mean the same thing as shows. This leaves us with only B, exaggerates, D, reflects. Both these words mean similar things as shows. However, exaggerates is a little bit stronger. It goes a little bit further. Does the teacher's animated manner exaggerate his passion, or does it reflect his passion? Well, it probably doesn't exaggerate his passion, because passion is already a strong word, so it would be really hard to exaggerate it, and also, I don't know why you would. Reflex is a much better answer, so let's cross off B, exaggerates, and circle D, reflects, as the correct answer. Now we are ready to go to the last step. Step four, replay the crime. This is where we just quickly read the sentence back to ourselves and do a final check to make sure the sentence works. Whether Jones is teaching advanced art classes or beginner ones, the teacher's animated disposition reflects his passion on his field. Sounds good. We nailed it. Great, now let's go over the second question. This time we're going to pick up the pace a bit. Let's get used to rolling that wheel a little bit faster. Okay, so the second question reads, when the editor-in-chief addresses his employees, he is very powerful and often has more blank than do the other editors. Step one, what are the context clues here? I would have circled powerful. This tells us that whether the editor-in-chief has, it is related to his being powerful. Step two, now let's fill in the blank. What expectation word would you leave for the blank? I would have put in the word power. Yeah, you see, I cheated a bit. All I did was I stole my expectation word from earlier in the sentence. We know that the editor-in-chief is powerful, therefore he must have power. Duh. It's totally okay to steal words like this. In fact, it's better. Because it's faster and it's generally the best expectation word anyway. Now let's move on to step three. Step three. Read and eliminate the answer choices. Reading through the answer choices, I can quickly cross off pretense. Pretense means pretending. It's kind of like it sounds. If a person has pretense, he or she is pretending to be something he or she is not. Therefore, you can cross off B. What about C? Discrimination. Discrimination means the ability to discriminate or tell apart. Therefore, it does not mean the same thing as power. Let's cross that off. 
What about D, restraint, or E, integrity? Both of these things do not mean the same thing as power, so let's cross them off. Okay, now let's take a look on the only answer choice left. A, influence. That looks good. Someone that is powerful by definition has influence. Step four, replay the crime. Let's take one last look at the sentence. When the editor-in-chief addresses his employees, he is very powerful and often has more influence than do the other editors. Sounds good. We nailed it. I know that going through these four steps might seem like a ton of work, and you might wonder if it's the fastest, most effective way to do these questions. But the answer is yes. Once you get to be a rock star at these four steps, you will be able to do them so fast you might not have to write down the expectation words. And also, by forming an expectation before looking at the answer choices, you avoid falling into traps that are designed to trick you via the power of suggestion. That is a pitfall that you definitely want to jump around. So what now? Well, let's practice, practice, practice. No pain, no gain. So sorry guys, we got to do this. And this time we're going to pick up the speed even more. I'm going to give you four questions on the screen and you'll have four minutes to finish them. And if you need more time, please feel free to pause the button. After all, you are watching a video right now and I am working on your time. Good luck.
All right, guys, time's up. Hopefully, you are finding that these steps are getting easier and faster the more you practice, like a well-oiled machine. We're going to take a look at the answers right now. Now even if you nailed every question like a hammer to a loose step, it's still going to be tremendously helpful for you to go over the solutions with me. Why? Because watching me walk through my thought process for the four steps is an excellent way to drill the process into your head until it becomes as automatic to you as breathing. And isn't breathing important and great? That's just another thing breathing has in common with these four steps. Question number one reads, the speaker's voice was soft and tremulous. She had to blank to hear. First, without looking at the answer choices, I'm going to circle context clues, soft and tremulous, because now I know that she had to do something to hear due to the fact the speaker's voice is so soft. Now I move on to my second step to fill in the blank with an expectation word or phrase. Well, because the speaker's voice is so soft, I would imagine she would have to try very hard to hear. So that is my expectation phrase. Let's jot that over on the blank. Now it's time to look at the answer choices. I can cross off mask, remember, reflect, and contemplate because neither of these words means anything similar to try very hard or has anything to do with having trouble hearing. Answer choice A, strain, on the other hand, makes great sense. If a voice is soft, you definitely would have to strain to hear. So that's our last step. We plugged our answer choice back into the blank and make sure it all makes sense and sounds dandy. Well, it sure does. Sounds as sweet as pie. Time to put down the fork and move on. Ah, question number two. Did you get this question wrong? If yes, then I can tell you right off the bat that you probably did not follow our four steps. Let's go through them now together. The question reads, the battle was not a blank rising of individual citizens, but was instead a scrupulously organized and carefully planned event. First, let's make like a detective and circle individual and carefully planned event because it's important to note that the battle was not just a bunch of people who all on their own woke up and decided to raise against enemy forces. Instead, it was carefully planned in advance. Therefore, my expectation words will be unplanned. Great. Now and only now can I look at the answer choices. Ah, this problem is a fabulous one to illustrate the power of our expectation word. Because we know that we are looking for something that means unplanned. Cross off A, premeditated, and E, theoretical, because those mean nothing similar to unplanned. In fact, premeditated means the opposite. It means you definitely thought out and meditated the event beforehand. Did you accidentally choose answer choice A? Well, if so, you're not alone. A ton of people who don't form expectation words will circle A as the correct answer because the word premeditated will catch their eye. It sounds a whole lot like it would fit in the sentence since we see words like organized and carefully planned. And that's the trick here. It's a trap. Do not step into it. Build the bridge and safely walk over it. Always come up with your expectation word before considering answer choices. The correct answer here is C, spontaneous, which means spur of the moment or unplanned. Let's plug that back in. The battle was not a spontaneous rising of individual citizens, but was instead a scrupulously organized and carefully planned event. Beautiful. Like music to my ears, lovely enough to move my soul. So, let's move on. Question 3 reads, 
The anarchists aroused fiery antagonism and animosity among governmental officials because he blank many blank laws and beliefs. Okay, okay, this is getting trickier. A two blank question? That's new for us. What do we do here? Two blank strategy? We actually do the exact same four steps, except we do it twice, one blank at a time. That's right, we sleuth each blank at a time. Confused? Here, I'll show you how. First thing, let's play detective and find our context clues. I circled fiery antagonism and animosity because now we know the anarchist must have done something that made government officials get their panties all up in a bunch. In case you didn't know, antagonism and animosity both mean something like anger and hatred. Kind of like how you feel towards the whole SAT process. Am I right? That's okay. We'll get through this together. You might even start to like it. Moving on. Here's the one blank at a time part. Let's first only come up with the expectation word for one blank first. It doesn't matter which one, so choose the easiest one or the one that scares you the least. I chose the first blank. So if the anarchist is making the government officials all hot and bothered, then he must be opposing laws and regulations. Therefore, opposed is my expectation word. Groovy. Now what? Now we go to the answer choices. Remember, we are only looking at the first blank right now. So that's only the first word in each answer choice. Great. Right off the bat, let's cross off answer choice B, tolerated, and answer choice E, observed. Because those two are clearly the opposite of opposed. But undermined and disregarded sound similar to opposed. So we keep those and head back to the second blank. I'm going to form my expectation word now. An anarchist really wants to change the current state of things. So I'm going to form the expectation word current for the second blank. Back to the answer choices now. The correct answer is answer choice C, established, because something that is established is also current. Iconoclastic, in case you didn't know, means something new that is against the current state. Therefore, it is the exact opposite of the word we wanted. Don't get tricked by trying to circle the hardest sounding word. Last step. Let's read the sentence one quick last time. The anarchist aroused fiery antagonism and animosity among government officials because he opposed many established laws and beliefs. Does that work? Yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. It most superbly does. Kind of like a key in a lock. Sweet. Let's grab that point and move on. Question four now. Last one. It reads, oftentimes scientists in the same field can act not as competing blank, but as effective blank, working ultimately towards the same end. So another two blanker here. Just because there's two blanks doesn't mean that you should draw a blank. <laughs> Get it? Let's find our context clues. I circled working ultimately towards the same aim because now we know that scientists are not competing but instead working together. This time, let's start with the second blank so I can show you that you definitely can do it. So scientists who work towards the same ends are effective what? I'm going to expect the word teams since teams work together. Now let's go to the answer choices and only look at the second blank. Right off the bat, let's quickly cross off A, competitors, B, pundits, C, surrogates, and D, usifers, because those aren't the same thing as a team. In case you didn't know, a surrogate is kind of like a substitute. 
like a surrogate mother. But Yusufer is something who tries to steal the power, kind of like a royal nephew who kills the king and then takes over the throne. And a pundit is an expert, kind of how like you're going to become an SAT pundit. So just like that, we only have one answer choice left, and we didn't even look at the first blank. Sweet! Let's plug in the words and make a final check to see if the sentence makes sense. Oftentimes, scientists in the same field can act not as competing opponents, but as effective collaborators working ultimately towards the same ends. Ah, another match made in heaven. Correct answers just bring a tear to my eye and a smile to my face. Not to mention a point to my SAT score. I love it. And that's a wrap, folks. We crushed our first lecture together. The questions we went over today are medium in difficulty. So don't fret your pretty heads if they were too hard or too easy. We'll cover more sentence completion problems and tips that are exactly your level in our live focus workshop titled Sentence Completion Keys. I'll meet you back here for our second critical reading lecture where we'll cover reading passages. Before I let you go though, let's talk homework. The absolute best way to make sure you get most accurate practice you can get is by practice tests that are written by College Board themselves. So put your skills to the test and good luck. And after you are done, make sure you input your answers at myesat.com for automated grading and score tracking. After you're done with that, I'll see you back in class for Critical Reading 2 where we're going to switch gears and get hot and heavy with reading passages. Adios amigos and I'll see you soon.